Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Richard Tate. Good morning. Wow, this is cool. So, I don't know about you, but my brain is full. I feel super better already. Um, we're running a little bit short on time, but luckily Jane has already presented all of our research at Hope Lab. Um, just kidding, Jane. Um, actually, it's, actually, it's exciting for us to be here. Um, we've been involved in the social impact game space for many years now at Hope Lab. But this is the first time that we've actually shared our work uh, with the audience here. So it's uh, really cool to be here with all of you, and it's really exciting to be a part of this community. Um, to get started, I want to share with you a question that someone asked me recently. The gaming industry is dot, dot, dot. Um, I'm going to give you a second to answer that for yourself. The gaming industry is, for me, the answer is the aim gaming industry is going to change the world for good. Now, it's true, Jane presented a lot of data. More and more games and gamified systems are part of everyday lives around the world. So the gaming industry is changing the world. And it is also true that collectively, in the industry, in this room today, we have the insights, we have the expertise, we have the opportunity to create games that actually change the world for good that actually have positive impact in the world. And that is really exciting to me, and it's really exciting to us at Hope Lab. Plus, games are fun, so if you're gonna change the world, why not do it with games, right? So Hope Lab is a small nonprofit. I'm here representing my colleagues back in Redwood City, California. And we were founded about 10 years ago by Pam Omidyar. Some of you may know her. Um, Pam is our board chair. And for the past 10 years, we've been working in the social impact game space, researching and developing products specifically focused on health and young people. Um, what I'd like to share with you today is a little bit of how our thinking has evolved in those last 10 years. For those of you who are either thinking about developing a social impact game or perhaps are sort of mulling through where you might go next in your own work, hopefully the insights and our own thinking might inform a little bit of what you're doing or at least provide you with a bit of inspiration. So um, one of the things that we, um, really focus on first is research. This is really where we've started. Um, what I'm gonna lead you through is both where we started from and then how our thinking has emerged to really focus on resilience, as, as Jane alluded to. Um, we have been doing a lot of work evaluating games and developing games, and we've come to ask ourselves this question, how might we create games that support resilience in young people in particular? And I'm gonna share with you why we think that that's an important st next step for us and why we think that the next 10 years of our work are likely to focus specifically on that. Now I have to tell you, we don't actually don't know the answer to how we ourselves are gonna develop an intervention for resilience, but we're looking at some interesting science that I think might inform a variety of approaches. And again, research is the starting point for us at Hope Lab. We think about research both in terms of informing how we develop products, but also we can develop or we conduct scientific outcomes research to understand the impact that our products have on the people who play them. And Jane shared some of that work with you. Innovation is also key to how we do our work at Hope Lab. And we think about innovation not necessarily as developing novel technologies or new game mechanics, but in applying these tools in unconventional ways to meet unmet needs. And this last piece is really important, customer input. In fact, it's probably one of the most important parts of what we do. We spend a lot of time talking to customers to understand what their needs are, but also to understand what is working about our products and, more importantly, what isn't. If we're not engaging uh, players in the games and the, and the products that we create, we can't have the impact that we're after. And that's something that we're very conscious of in how we work. Oftentimes, we describe our work at Hope Lab as harnessing the power and appeal of technology to improve the health of young people. Now, historically, at Hope Lab, our work has been in health, uh, both mental health, psychological health, as well as physiological health. And we focused on teens and adolescents, particularly young people who are facing chronic illnesses. And most of our work has been in games. And that's because games have proven for us to be a really powerful tool to achieve something that I think all of us in this room care about and that is positive behavior change. So whether you're interested in ending poverty, ending war, um, addressing uh, domestic violence or literacy issues, 
It's likely that you're looking to create a product or an experience that is going to motivate and inspire people to take action and to help overcome a challenge. So at Hope Lab, we similarly are focused on positive behavior change, particularly how to drive positive, healthy behavior in young people. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with their work, I want to show you a couple of things that, um, that we've made available in the world. The first product is Remission, which Jane introduced you to. Remission is uh, a third-person shooter. There's 20 levels of gameplay. And Remission essentially gives players the experience of blasting away at their own cancer in support of them fighting their disease. And this game was released in 2006. And in 2008, we published data in pediatrics along with some of our collaborators, demonstrating that playing remission boosts treatment adherence in young cancer patients. And as Jane alluded to, this treatment adherence metric is really, really important because kids who stick to their meds are far more less likely to have a recurrence of cancer. So our experience with remission it taught us that we actually could create a game that drove positive healthy behavior that led to a biological impact. The next product for us uh, really focused on this issue, uh, sedentary behavior and obesity in young people. Um, and again, we turned to games and gaming to create an experience that tapped into the motivational aspect of games to encourage kids to move around more and, and, and experience that as rewarding and fun for them. That gamified experience is something that we call Zamzi, and we're really excited to have this work recognized uh, by Games for Change as a nominee in the Games for Change Awards. And actually, I'd encourage you all to demo it when you uh, have a chance in the lobby today. But Zamzi basically inspires kids to move more by providing them with rewards uh, and a fun experience as they move around. Similar to remission, we put ZAMSI through some rigorous scientific evaluations. And in the studies that we've conducted, we see that ZAMSI boosts physical activity in kids by as much as 30% or more on average. That's an incredible outcome. That's equivalent to, uh, to running an additional marathon a month per kid in these studies. So we're really excited about that outcome. In fact, uh, later this year, we'll be publishing data, data from a six-month study evaluating not just physical activity levels, but also biometric data to understand how this experience is, is, is be potentially changing the long-term health benefits for kids who use ZAMSI. So as we have looked at our data, as we have reflected on our experience with this product, here's what we've learned. We have learned that we can use play-based experiences, we can use games to trigger positive emotions that cause people to act differently in the world. Specifically with remission, we've learned that self-efficacy, giving young people a sense of power and control in the face of their disease, is an active ingredient in creating behavior change games. With Zamzi, we've begun to understand how to motivate kids to take action, um, specifically using positive psychology and a moderate amount of extrinsic reward to get kids up off the couch, just a boost of incentive that then bridges to potentially intrinsic motivation that gives them an experience that's fun and engaging and that ultimately, ultimately gets them moving because it feels good. And across both of these projects, what we've learned is that social connection is key. From remission, we hear constantly from patients and clinicians that the game uh, allows them to talk about the challenges of cancer and cancer treatment, which has also been really difficult for young people to do. Um, with Zamzi, we've also heard that um, uh, we've also heard that uh, kids who play with Zamzi in sibling pairs or with friends are actually more active, about double, twice as active as kids who use it alone. So this social connection component is really important. But we've begun to ask ourselves this question: How can we support? How can games support resilience? And here's why. As we thought about what we've learned, we realized that we could apply those things to diseases or diagnoses, but how might we actually use what we've learned to address health problems before kids are experiencing a crisis? How might we use what we've learned to actually get in front of the problem? And this is how we got to this particular question. Now, as you look at the scientific, uh, scientific literature, there are a couple of different opportunities for how games might support resilience. And Jane alluded to a couple of these. The first definition is resilience in the face of uh, chronic adversity. Resilience that allows people to thrive even in the face of persistent challenges. And examples of this might include poverty 
or uh, domestic violence, things that create chronic stress in an environment. The second definition is resilience as the ability to bounce back from a significant adverse event, like a health crisis or a concussion or a natural disaster. And we believe that games have the potential to support both of these types of resilience, in part because games incorporate play. And play is potentially one of our most valuable, untapped natural resources. Play connects us to our innate capability and curiosity to learn, our curiosity and our hope, um, our curiosity and our ability to connect with others. Play, in essence, gives us the experience of resilience. It teaches us resilience. In particular, we are curious about um, a concept called values affirmation. And this is a place where we're exploring um, how we might develop uh, a tool that addresses resilience in young people. And the literature tells us that there are a lot of non-gaming contexts in which values affirmation, creating authentic connection between people, connecting people to things that they care about, their values. In non-gaming contexts, this has been quite successful. So we see an opportunity here to leverage this as we create games and interventions that support resilience. And actually, as we look into the environment, we see that there are systems and tools that have emerged, like Facebook, that are really good at establishing connection and fostering community, which can be core components to resilience. And more exciting than that, as Jane just described, there are products like Superbetter that are actually intentionally designed to foster this kind of authentic connection and to begin to cultivate resilience. For us, in particular at Hope Lab, because our interest is health, we're curious about how this social experience gets inside the body and changes the physiological health, the long-term health of people. And that's really where we're focusing our efforts. And we're doing this through a couple of projects that I wanted to give you some insight into. The first is at one extreme end of the, of the, of the spectrum. We're doing some work with child soldiers in Nepal a country where civil war over the course of a decade killed over 13,000 people and displaced about 100,000 more. And in this work, we're actually looking to understand what the biology of resilience in the face of extreme adversity looks like. So in this study, working with these child soldiers, we're looking both at mental health outcomes and biological measures of resilience to understand what innate capacity and capabilities, what biomarkers exist that we might nurture and amplify to support people in being resilient in the face of extreme adversity. It's really exciting work. And on the other end of the spectrum is work that we're doing around how helping other people can actually get into the body and pr improve your physiological experience. This is more along the lines of a stealing effect. How do you support people in cultivating re resilience in an ongoing way? And in this work, we're actually looking um, at a study of young people who are coaching and fostering young students in a variety of different activities, homework, arts and crafts, and other uh, activities. And we're looking not only, again, at psychological outcomes, but how that experience gets into their body and potentially improves uh, their stress levels over time. How might we begin to foster that to improve resilience over the long term is what our interest is. So I mentioned these two studies to you in this work in values affirmation just to give you a sense of where we're headed with our work with remission. Again, our focus is research and a part of what we see as our value add in the world is actually contributing to our collective understanding of how games work from a scientific perspective. So as we progress with this work in resilience, we look forward to sharing with you some data and insights along the way. But what I would offer you is that, again, all of us are working in spaces where adversity is, um, in many ways, the real challenge. We're looking to create experiences that actually inspire people to stand up, um, get, obtain a sense of power and control, and face the challenges that they're facing. And I think that resilience for all of us is an opportunity for us to improve lives, not just for individuals, but potentially for communities and the world. And if we're successful, this statement might indeed be true. So I encourage you all over the next couple of days to take advantage of the collective experience in this room, to look for unconventional inspiration, and to think about how you can help us deliver on this mission. I'm really excited to get to know some of you. Um, I know that I've moved through our work rather quickly, so I would be happy to share in more detail how we're thinking about this work. And very quickly, I just want to acknowledge a number of inspirations, and again, I can share in more detail some of the things that we're looking at to inform our work ahead. 
And with that, I thank you.